Hello, and welcome back to Quantal U, Episode 2. We learned in the first episode that not only are we physical beings, for example, made up of matter, but we are also electromagnetic and vibratory beings, and that this energy field is just as essential to life and vitality as is your heart, liver, or blood supply. Remember CPR? We're watching the electromagnetic conduction of the heart. If it stops, we fail to exist. Well, the incredible thing is that this field is actually a part of an even bigger, more intelligent and conscious field that carries important information about our health and our lives. In 1994, a panel of scientists from the National Institute of Health described this as a field of information that surrounds and interpenetrates the human body. It is composed of both measurable and electromagnetic energy, as well as a subtle energy that some call chi. And it's possible to influence this field either positively or negatively. Today, we'll learn what this field is, the scientific evidence that supports its existence, and I will show the science behind the incredible role that it plays in your health. Finally, we'll discuss what actually determines your genetic destiny and ultimately your health. But before we discuss what the field is exactly, let's first take a quick look back in history during a very religious and spiritual uprising, a time when many scientists believe that a field of energy connected all of life and one which has a significant influence in our lives. The field name was coined the ether, and in 1887, Two scientists by the name of Michelson and Morley developed an experiment to see if they could prove that this field existed. So they built an inframeter, which is two mirrors that sit perpendicular to each other, and another partial mirror called a silver mirror that sits in the middle. This silver mirror allows light to pass through and reflect to both mirrors. And their hypothesis was that if this field existed, when they shot a beam of light, it would pass through and reflect to both perpendicular mirrors, causing the light to then be reflected back to the silver mirror. When the wave of the light re-hits the silver mirror from both mirrors, the scientists presumed they would observe an interference pattern, proving the existence of the field. Unfortunately, their observation showed no interference pattern and to them subsequent proof that the field didn't exist. The results from the study were soon published all over the world and beliefs that were formed as a result of this study drastically sent us down the trajectory to where we are today in terms of our approach and treatment of disease. These two belief systems included, one, we are separate from everything else, and two, as such, only physical external approaches to healthcare will be effective. For example, consume a pill, have a surgery, exercise harder, eat a better diet. Well, almost 100 years later, in 1986 to be exact, another study was conducted by the United States Air Force, and this time headed by a man named Silvertooth. And other than having a more advanced equipment, the experiment was essentially the same but this time it worked. They found the exact interference pattern they were looking for, thus proving the existence of the field, and the study was published August of 1986 in Nature, volume 322. What's even more fascinating is that in 1918, almost 30 years after the Michelson and Morley experiment, and 70 years before the Air Force study, a man by the name of Max Planck was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his discovery of quantum physics. And although not proven by science until 1986, and even though he couldn't definitively prove his conclusions, the discovery of quantum physics and his observations led Planck to no other answer. All matter originates and exists by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscience and intelligent mind. The mind is the matrix of all matter. So what is Planck saying here? Well, to put it simply, the field is the force and all matter exists because of this force. He goes on to say how this field is also the mind or the consciousness, meaning that the field is also a thinking, 
intelligent force. It, it is the container, the matrix, the inner web of connection for all matter, or in other words, it is the space between all matter. And while we discussed in episode one, let me recap what I mean when I say matter. Matter is the substance or substances of which any physical object consists or is composed. The matter uh, of which the earth is made. So according to what Planck is stating, this force or field is the space between everything physical, which is the matter. So how is this possible? Well, the answer to this question lies in one single event, which was also the biggest moment in the evolution of our universe, the Big Bang. Do you remember learning about the Big Bang Theory in junior high? Well, I distinctly remember the discussion of science versus religion, and if one were to prove their theory over the other, it would end the centuries-old battle about how the universe began. The other interesting fact I remember learning was that if you were to take all the matter of the universe, remove all the empty space, and compress the matter until it is physically touching, it would be the actual size of a little green pea, which is the size that the universe was milliseconds prior to the Big Bang. It's said that matter comprises only 4% of the universe. So what happens when matter is physically separated? Or to be more clear, what happened to the matter, these subatomic particles, right after the Big Bang? Well, a study out of the University of Geneva in Switzerland in 1997 answers this question. It's called the Twin Photon Experiment. And as a quick reminder, a photon is the smallest discrete amount or quantum of electromagnetic radiation and is the basic unit of all light. Photons are always in motion and in a vacuum they travel at a constant speed. A stream of photons can act both as a wave and as a particle. They are subatomic or force particles that help to make up an atom. And they are also under the heading of what's called a boson particle, which means that since we are made of photons, we are also made of light. The experiment took a photon that they split in half, making two identical photons. These were put in a vacuum and directed to go seven miles in opposite directions. They interacted or tickled one photon and observed that the other photon, 14 miles away, reacted as if it had been stimulated as well. The same exact instantaneous reaction, and it proved that once matter is separated physically, it will always remain connected energetically. The experiment defied the laws of Newtonian physics and is what we now call quantum entanglement. And according to Wikipedia, quantum entanglement is the physical phenomenon that occurs when a pair or group of particles is generated, interact with, or share spatial proximity in a way such that the quantum state of each particle of the pair or group cannot be described independently of the state of the others, including when the particles are separated by large distance. In other words, entangled particles will always remain energetically connected and the actions performed on one will affect the other, even when separated by great distances. So now that you understand this important piece of information, let's trace back to the Big Bang. So if only 4% of our universe is physical matter, does that mean then that 96% of our universe is empty space, or what we presume is empty space? Well, the Big Bang answers this question, and since 2012, science finally has a definitive answer. So immediately after the explosion, you have compressed matter spreading very quickly. And when this occurred, the matter that had been compressed began to separate physically, of which only 4% developed into mass that then evolved to become the planets, the sun, the earth, and us. So the question remains, what energetic phenomenon happened milliseconds after the Big Bang to lead us into creation? Well, the answer to this question comes out of a facility in Geneva, Switzerland called CERN. CERN is the largest superconductive supercollider and is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It is also one of the most well-respected centers for scientific research. Here, they experiment with quantum particles that are put into cylindrical tunnels and travel just under the speed of light. 
and under certain conditions, they make these particles collide, recreating the Big Bang. Their hope was to determine what precipitated the formation of physical form and mass from the compressed matter. And so when these particles collide, they break into a million fragments that create specific patterns with typical characteristics. It's really important to know that the mere act of colliding subatomic particles together does not destroy the particles themselves, but instead allows an opportunity for them to become something different, to transform. So the scientists postulated that there must be what they were calling a God particle or force that when the explosion occurred was responsible for the formation of matter into mass and the subsequent start to the creation of the galaxy we, we now live in. Certain scientists believed that if they observed these collisions under certain conditions, that they would be able to discover this God particle and the force that created it. So what did they find? Well, they found that some of the particles sped up after the explosion, and some of the particles began to slow down. And the particles that began to slow down are what became the mass or the physical form. So how and why did some speed up and some slow down? Well, the old model of particle physics is based on the notion of symmetries in nature, that the physical properties of matter remain unchanged under some transformation, such as a rotation in space or a collision, or for example, the Big Bang. However, this is not what they found when doing the experiments and instead found an area of mass created at the energy level of 126 giga electron volts. It was found exactly where it should have been as predicted by quantum theory math decades earlier. This area of mass has since been named the Higgs particle after Peter Higgs, who in 1964, along with five other individuals, proposed their field theory to explain how particles obtain their mass. The identification proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the field was real as the creation of the Higgs particle was only possible if the field existed. And since the discovery of this particle, it has also become a powerful tool in the search for new physics. So since we now know that the field is what gives subatomic particles their mass, it can therefore be said to be the creator behind the universe. It is because of it that we, you and I, your favorite pet, mom and dad, are here today. In other words, the Big Bang energy or force that was responsible for our universe becoming what it is, is the field. The force behind our now existence. The field is the container of all things. And everything that happens in the universe happens within it. It's the space between matter or the bridge to the inner and outer worlds. It's also the connection between the physical matter and the inner electromagnetic and vibratory you. It has an intimate connection and influence in our bodies that can impact the genes that we express and the disease systems we manifest. And most importantly, it is an intelligent field. And on July 4th, 2012, the Higgs boson and field discovery rocked the scientific community. And one year later, on October 8th of 2013, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded jointly to Francois Engelert and Peter Higgs for their theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of the mass of subatomic particles, and which was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. So the field itself is very elusive, and as discussed above, not easily measured. It has been known by many names, which include the ether, the source field, the quantum field, the divine matrix, the matrix, and the biofield. But for the purposes of this program, however, let's simply call it the field. And would it surprise you to know that both our military and certain compartmentalized areas of the government know about the field and have used it for projects and missions? Project Stargate being one such example. This was developed during the Cold War um, and it dealt primarily with remote viewing, which by definition is the practice of seeking impressions about a distant or unseen target, purportedly using extrasensory perception or sensing with the mind. Many, many missions and experiments were performed under Project Stargate, now of which are all declassified. 
It lasted from the onset of the Cold War up until the early 1990s when at that time they were discovered and so the file was closed. Another such example of using the field is when you reach for the phone to call a friend and when they answer, they exclaim they were just thinking about you too and were about to call, even though you hadn't spoken in six months. Several years ago, I distinctly remember a time when I was up at my in-laws in Cascade, Idaho. Right outside their beautiful cabin was several feet of snow, mountains, and a massive forest. It was the middle of the night and we were all sleeping when suddenly I woke and felt the need to check on my then 18-month-old daughter. And I felt fear, which had never happened before. So I looked in her bed and she wasn't there. We were sleeping in rooms above the garage in which you have to walk down stairs and through the mudroom into the main living area of the house. It was here that I finally found her 20 feet from the door, sleepwalking for the first time that I'd ever known of. Was this mother's intuition? Well, we all accept the notion that intuition exists, but the question remains, how? Well, now we know. <laughs> I am quantum entangled with my daughter, and this entanglement could very possibly have saved her life. Matter that is joined physically will always remain linked energetically, even when they are separated by large distances. Two, there is a proven field that we know is responsible for the creation of the universe. Three, the field is connected to everything. And four, we are energy vibratory beings and physical matter and mass, and as such should treat both aspects when it comes to our health. How then can the field influence our DNA and therefore our genetic expression? Well, before we begin, let's define a few terms. So a gene, a gene is a sequence of nucleotides within DNA or RNA that encodes the synthesis of a gene product, either RNA or a protein. For example, blue eyes and brown hair versus heart disease or diabetes. All examples of a gene expression, but the difference is that we aren't born with heart disease. The process through which coronary artery disease occurs is because the gene for plaque development was upregulated at some point in our lives. Upregulated due to stress, diet, lack of exercise, smoking, or many other environmental factors. And would it surprise you to learn that one gene has approximately 3,000 potential expressions or different proteins that it can make? Additionally, they don't normally cause disease. They are simply the blueprint. And when a gene is turned on or off, it changes only the readout or what is expressed. In fact, only six diseases are caused by a single gene. These, these include hemophilia, Marfan's disease, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, and Tay-Sachs disease. So how does the field interact with and influence our DNA? Well, one of the first experiments to show this relationship was performed in 1982. It was called the vacuum DNA phantom effect in vitro and its possible rational explanation. It was published in the Journal of Nanobiology in 1995. The experiment took photons, remember these subatomic light particles, and put them in a vacuum. Once inside the vacuum, they observed the photons to be completely random and chaotic. The scientists then added DNA to the vacuum with the photons, and suddenly the photons went from being completely random to becoming completely ordered. The only variable, the addition of DNA. And when scientists were asked to discuss the experiment, all they could say is that the light was behaving surprisingly and counterintuitively. The second study was published in 1994 in the Journal of Scientific Exploration called Structural Changes in Water and DNA Associated with New Physiological Measurable States. This was a two-part study. The scientists took distilled water, observing it under a microscope. Then they separated it into several test tubes. Half of these were placed in an entirely different location as the control group. The other half of the test tubes with distilled water were given to several meditationalists who were instructed to go into a meditative state as evidenced by their vitals and an electrocardiograph. During these meditations, they were told to set positive thoughts and intention towards the water and to visually see the water changing its structure during the meditation. The idea was that they would use the field to physically change the structure of water to a more active, higher frequency water. 
the results. Beautiful snowflake appearing water molecules from the treated versus untreated water. Now in the second part of the study, the scientists took identical DNA strands, placing them in both the treated and the untreated water. And what they find? The results suggest that the water structured in the above experiments facilitates the spontaneous tendency of DNA to rewind or decrease absorb absorbance. In other words, the treated more active water actually affected the DNA to begin to unwind as if it were about to replicate. Whereas in the control group, the DNA remained tightly coiled and unstimulated to make new proteins. And a third study took pure, untouched umbilical cord DNA within the electromagnetic reach of the heart, approximately six to 10 feet from the body. There were no other environmental influences around. The experiment was to measure the reaction of the DNA within this field. Well, what'd they find? They found that the DNA again started to relax and unwind, just as in the studies we discussed prior. And when DNA relaxes, it's making proteins, all stimulated by being placed within the electromagnetic field of a beating heart. So now that we see the relationship between the field and our DNA, let's talk about the top influencers that determine what proteins our genes will express. Well, the term is called epigenetics, and what science is now finding is that your environment is 90 to 95% responsible for disease. Find out more in the next episode where we'll define this term and show you the role it plays in the field and your health. I'm Dr. Elisa Peavy. Thanks for watching.